Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, the live version today. You know, the world of work today is, for many of us, virtual. As leaders, if you're leading a virtual team, you are also a virtual teammate. Today, we're going to want you to wear both hats, the leader hat and the teammate hat for this timely conversation. And as I said, this is another live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. If you're watching later in your normal podcast approach, you can get all future live episodes. You can get ahead of the game and er interact with us and see them sooner by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn. And if you are here with us live, feel free to ask questions and enjoy the conversation just as if, just like you think about doing when you're here on the podcast. Man, I wish I could ask that question. Well, now you can if you're with us live. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by The Long Distance Teammate, our new book. If you work remotely, you want to be more effective, more productive, more engaged, and more connected, this book will help you get there because there's a big difference between working from home and being an engaged and effective remote teammate. You can learn more and pre-order your copy today starting at longdistanceteammate.com. And today is a special episode because uh, if you're watching, you can see that my guest here is Wayne Tremell. He's the co-author of that book. And uh, Wayne and I have been working together for a number of years. And I believe I was on his podcast way back in the day, three times or something like that. And I believe this is the third time that he's been on with me uh, once a couple of years ago, once at the start of the pandemic when everyone was freaking out with all of the remote work stuff. And now today to talk about this new book of ours, The Long Distance Teammate. So Wayne is a longtime expert in remote work and remote leadership, remote communication. Uh, he's written a number of books. We'll talk about some of those as we go. He's not only written a number of business titles and co-written some of those with me, he's also written a number of novels and maybe we'll get him to talk a little bit about, bit about that as well. He is my friend, he is my colleague, I write his paycheck, but more than that, uh, I'm happy to have him here today with me again. Welcome, Wayne, back to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Well, thank you. And I have to tell you, of all the things that you have written, my paycheck is my favorite. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's good. That is excellent. All right. Big fan so, of your work. <laughs> all right. So, so I didn't do the formal introduction. Here's where Wayne is from, British Columbia and all that stuff. But you do have an interesting journey, and and I often open this sh these shows, uh, Wayne, by asking people to tell us about their journey. But I want to ask you a little more specifically. So, um, you didn't wake up, you know, as an eight year old saying, "I want to be an expert in remote work and remote communication." Uh, but tell us a little bit about your journey. But mostly, I really want to hear about how did you end up in this whole remote space long before most anyone else was thinking about it. Oh wow. Okay. Well, a lot of people watching this, I'm sure are familiar with some of my work in the past. So I'll, I'll give you the uh, truncated version. I actually was in the entertainment business for a long time. I was a stand-up comic. I was a would-be screenwriter. That's what brought me from Canada to Los Angeles. At some point, the wife and child insisted on eating and so <laughs> time to get a big boy job, as I like to call it, running away from the circus. Um, and so I flailed around for a while trying to figure out what could I do with a almost 20 year hole in my resume and realized I only had one marketable skill at the time, which was I stand there and talk. So corporate training seemed like a reasonable place to go. And so I kind of took all the courses and stuff that I could take uh, short of actually going to school like a regular person and got a job with a training company turned into a bunch of stuff. I was the head of training for um, a company called Communispawn, which was big in the presentation skills space. And I realized pretty early on, uh, this is 2003, 2004. Somebody said to me in class one time, you know, presentation skills are great, uh, but I only talk to real people like four times a year. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I work remotely from everybody else. And there's this new thing called WebEx that we're using a lot. And that's mostly 
how I talk to people. And I realized that nobody, that this was going to be a critical tool in people's lives, this ability to communicate that way. And nobody was teaching people how to do that. And so when so you took I, it upon yourself, Wayne. Well, when I I started inside the company I was working in, trying to get them to pay some attention to this, as this was going to be a trend. And then when, as all good things do, you know, I find myself in the parking lot with my stuff in a cardboard box, which is how most consultancies get started. Uh, I thought th there's something here. And that's when I started greatwebmeetings.com and I was doing uh, the Cranky Middle Manager podcast. And that's about the time that we crossed trails. Yep. Uh, and then and jumping forward, uh, you really did become the expert on remote communication, remote presentation skills. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then it's like the old commercials. Uh, for the uh, Victor Kayam. I liked it so much. I bought the company, right? So that's kind of how that, that's how it all happened. So, so enough about sort of the past. I really want us to talk about the future, but it does help people get a sense of your, of your background. Wayne, go well, it, it does. And I, I think it's really important for this conversation is that, you know, one of the things about working remotely is people, can you build real relationships? Can you do stuff? I mean, you and I knew each other for several years before we ever met in person. That's correct. And even once we decided to work together, we actually physically were together two, three times a year. Uh, well, so we have we've been never living, been together much more than that. Right. Absolutely. So we have been living this relationship building collaboration thing not just as kind of experts or consultants, but this has been it's been my life for over 15 years and together we've worked now, what, six or more six or seven years. Yeah. Something like that. And uh, yeah. And I've had at least part of my, our team be a remote for almost a decade. So uh, the title of this episode is what it takes to me to be what it takes to be a long distance teammate. And uh, we consciously picked the word teammate. So Wayne, talk about, the difference uh, between team member or teammate. Why? Did, yeah. Why, why is what's why were we conscious about that, and why is that important? Well, I, I think one of the challenges that teams people were facing is a lot of people were working from home, working remotely. Anybody who answers to the same boss is a member of the team. And that's fine. You can individually do your thing. But most of us aspire to more than just being an individual cog in the machine. Work has a social aspect and a psychological aspect. And, uh, you know, work for most people involves working with other people. And that can be a transactional experience or it can be a pleasing, fulfilling, energizing experience. And the word teammate had that psychological oomph to it, that team member, being a member of the team is kind of the floor. That's the bare minimum. Well, and you can be saying, hey, you're on the team. Okay. But what does that mean, right? Like that next level of um, now uh, I'm a part of something. It's a part of me. Uh, I care, all those things, right? Well, it talks to uh, how much, you know, if I really care, I'm going to give you some discretionary effort, right? If a member of the team is struggling, I'm going to jump in to help. If the team is hitting its goals, I'm going to be excited and energized by that. Um, you know, there's a step above just ourselves. And at the same time, there's a very self-driven piece of being a teammate that a lot of people don't pay attention to. There's this notion that being a teammate is a selfless act and you're constantly giving, just as the whole idea of servant leadership can kind of have a dark side where you're doing all the giving and not getting what you need from it, right? Yep. Uh, being a teammate doesn't always mean 
while it frequently does mean taking one for the team or doing some discretionary effort or whatever, it doesn't mean you're constantly sacrificing yourself on the altar of the team. Yeah, I'm reaching around here for a copy of the book, and here it is. Uh, there's a key word in this title after the word teammate. The next word down here is engaged. And so I want to talk about that for a second, because I think when we first started thinking about this book, or we had a title, or we, had, and we were first having a conversation with our publisher about it, we talked about this word engagement. And, you know, I like to call it the myth of engagement, which says, Engagement belongs to the leaders, and this is the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. And so what is what is your take or what is our take on what engagement means, but more importantly, who does it belong to? Well, it's funny, and I don't think I've ever told you this. Um, I had this conversation when I was still doing the Cranky Middle Manager show with an extremely well-known human being, so I won't out him. But once the, the conversation stopped and we were just chatting and we were talking about what he was doing next and he was doing a book on engagement and he says, I don't want to do this book. And I said, why not? He said, most of the talk about engagement is BS. And he didn't say BS. And I went, oh, tell me more. <laughs> and he said something that I had believed for a long time and that you and I uh, certainly have had plenty of conversations about which is for somebody to truly engage. The company can have all the pizza parties and mission statements and good work and everything that they want and make it easy for people to engage with them. But at the end of the day, whether or not you engage is totally up to you. It's a decision that you make. Now, companies and some of them do a superb job of making it really easy to disengage. <laughs> they, well, they yes, there are to make that happen. There are things that we can do as leaders to support or or take away from that yeah. choice, right? But ultimately, it's that choice. And I think the reason I want to say it there is because you were heading there with the whole idea of teammate, right? Yeah. Like fair or not, uh, if I really see myself as truly a teammate, I'm much more likely to choose to be engaged. Absolutely. You know, if if I'm a team member and all I'm concerned about are my metrics and doing my thing, there is a level of proactivity and especially discretionary effort. How hard people are willing to work, how much they're willing to invest in solving problems, how much they're willing to help their teammates comes from how much we care. And at the end of the day, engagement is how much do you care? It's really that simple. We we use all these lovely HR consultant-y words sometimes, but at the end of the day, engagement is how much do you care? Do you care about your work? Do you like your work? Do you like the people you work with? Are you energized by it? Then you're engaged. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I guess since we wrote a book together, that's probably a good thing. I am talking with Wayne Trammell, my co-author or the co-author of the long distance teammates stay engaged and connected while working anywhere. And, and Wayne, I'm, I'm certainly glad to have you. And, and again, for those, some of you know this, we are live. Um, well, if you're, if you're listening to this later, you know, we're not live to you, but if you're here live and have a question or a comment, feel free to share it. I'll see them and we'll in, include those in the conversation. So this is a leadership podcast. It's in the title. Wayne. And I said at the beginning that I wanted people to wear both hats. Yeah. Um, certainly everything that we've said, the hat of I'm the leader and hey, I'm also a team member because you are a teammate. You are a team member as a leader of at least two teams, the one you lead and the, the one of your peers. Um, but let's, let's explicitly put the leader hat on for a second. I mean, that's sure. in many ways why people come here uh, to this particular podcast. So Really quickly, what's the leader's role when they have a remote team? Give us two or three things that will help people think about that. Maybe how they need to think about it differently than when everyone was together. Well, of course, when we were talking about the long distance teammate, one of the first things that we said is the role hasn't actually changed all that much. I mean, the leader needs to do what the leader needs to do, whether you are all located or not, right? All the stuff, the 
um, setting the vision and managing performance and coaching and all of that stuff that leaders have to do still has to happen, right? So you've got the leadership role. I think there is an additional role for the leader, which is that of facilitator. Uh, and, and everybody, just so you know, that has never been Wayne's favorite word. It feels like a consultancy word to him as well, but go ahead. <laughs> go well, ahead it's Wayne. interesting because if you super look, important concept, go ahead. If you look at facilitator as the way it usually <laughs> gets dropped in these circles, right? Instructor, leader, whatever. But the word facile is Latin for to make easier. And that's the role of the leader is to make communication easier, to make work easier, to make hitting the goals easier. Uh, if we think about it in the true sense of the word, right, if we think about the verb facilitate, that's where on a remote team, the leader has some very specific, different things to do. Because a lot of the things that make teamwork easy, being close together, uh, passing each other in the hallway, you know, having to face somebody in a meeting when you missed a deadline and you don't really want to do that, so you better get that work done. Uh, those types of things don't happen organically on a remote team. Uh, every communication on a remote team, whether from the leader to the teammates or the teammates to each other, is intentional. You don't do it by accident. Yeah, it's very true. That's very and true. So, so be more intentional, right? Yeah. So, so we need to be more intentional about how we make it easier for people to work together. And some of that is creating connections or uh, allowing connections to happen or intentionally creating connections that wouldn't otherwise happen. And, and you know, a really simple example is... If we're working in the workplace and I hand you a project and I go find somebody to do this with, <laughs> right? Find somebody to help. It, it kind of happens organically. If I am working remotely as the leader, I might want to pair somebody who works remotely with somebody in the office to make sure that people are uh, connecting and uh, maintaining connections that might fade away otherwise. If you've got somebody who's an old hand at this, you may want to intentionally pair them with the new hire yeah, so that they are ramping up and becoming part of the team faster rather than letting Bob work with Alice because they've always worked together and they work really well. Maybe we need to create a different connection. And that is designed to ultimately facilitate the work. So a couple of things that you say there, that I think where I was talking about a little bit more. One is that that you didn't really quite say, but I think it's also true that it's it's harder if I if I as the boss say, hey Wayne, go find someone to help you with this. That's a harder request from your perspective, likely when you're not again not down the hall from people, right? So it, it you said it may happen more automatically when we're together, but it's just it's just a bigger lift. Like I don't even know. Where do I start? Who should I pick? That's the first part. But the second thing that you said, I think is super important. And the longer we're living in this world of remote work, the more likely it will be true for you is that as a leader and as a teammate, you're going to have new people on the team that were never in the location with other people before. So talk a little bit about that for us as a leader, as you're bringing on people that never were in the office with each other. Well, the trick when we're onboarding new team members, right, is you've got two things that need to happen. Number one is you want that person to start doing productive work as quickly as possible. And, you know, having them on the payroll while they fill out paperwork isn't doing productive work. But the other thing is you want to facilitate the team forming and coming together as a team as quickly as possible. And that means people need to get to know each other. They need to start to develop trust and they need to start to develop the personal connections. One of the biggest problems on remote teams, and it's, it's hard to know when it's happening until it's too late, is exclusion. It's not that I am intentionally not 
bringing the new person in. It's just, if I have a question, I'm going to go to the person I have an existing relationship with. I'm going to go to the person that I know knows the answer. I'm going to go to the person I enjoy talking to. And that's right? someone that I already know. Not and it's somebody that I already know. And it's not that I hate the new person. It's that either I don't know what they know. And so maybe if I need a quick answer, that's not the most productive use of my time. But it's also, I literally don't think about them because they're not sitting right there at the next desk staring at me. It's out of sight, out of mind. And while it's corrosive and a problem, 99 times out of 100, it's not intentional. It's just, I literally didn't think about that person yep. when I needed to do this task. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. So I want to get at a couple of very sort of specific areas for us as teammates. Uh, but before we sort of fully leave the leader space, uh, I, I want you to put on your future hat for a second. I mean, you are an author of a book about this after all, Wayne. So the question is, um, what do you see as we're having this conversation on the first work day of the year? And if people are subscribed to the podcast, they're getting it before the middle of the month in January, what are the challenges that you think remote leaders, long distance leaders are going to be yeah. facing that, that the ones that you can say with certainty, we need to be thinking about today? Yeah, I think there's uh, two that come immediately to mind. Uh, one is that, and I've been calling this, and this is horribly consultanty, I've been calling it the new abnormal which is this notion of a lot of people have been waiting for this disease to magically go away and then we can go back to the way things were and it ain't gonna happen. And not only is it not going to happen, it's not going to happen at different times in different ways, depending on where you are. Um, yep. It's people, it, it's not only country to country, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. If you've got a office building with 20 companies in it, every one of them is going to be working on a different time schedule, different amounts of people in the office at the same time, all of that. And so starting with the team level and going out to the organization, you're going to have to be really, really uh, aware of how are we going to do this? How are we going to get work done? And then over the year, that is likely to change. Yeah. Uh, but we need to be very aware and we can't wait for somebody else to make those decisions. We need to do that. And leaders are going to step up and say, hey, we can't wait for this to go away. We need to figure this out. That's one thing that's going to happen. It's going to put I, more can pressure. Can we stop there for one sec? Hold your yeah. second thought. And that is as a leader... Um, you don't have to have the answers to all that either. You can get your team. In fact, we would strongly encourage you to get your team involved in that. Okay, here's where we're at. What do you all think? And here's the thing. Don't ask if you don't want their help, number one. And if you're the person sitting there saying, I can't wait to get everybody back in the office, that's a whole nother issue because it probably isn't what you're going to get or even what, you're, or what your team members all want, right? Well, so, and that leads us to the second thing, Right. Look, look at us bouncing off each other. Uh, that leads us to the second thing, which is the one thing we do know is going to happen as offices reopen and we reconfigure the work is the balance of people in the office full time versus people working remotely full time is going to change from whatever it was. Uh, yeah. the, the hybrid team is going to become more and more the norm. Um, even if organizations decide, hey, two days a week, we're going to have everybody in the office for meetings and collaboration and good stuff and then let people work from home when they want. And there's going to be a lot of that. Um, that's going to change the dynamics of how teams work. And oh, it's we don't even that's going to be a huge change. Just think about it from a personal perspective. Now, for two days, I'm going to go in and I'm going to be in full on interaction mode. I'm going to probably be in more meetings than I can even imagine. And uh, that's and now how do I prioritize the rest of the work that still has to happen? And then how does that shift when I'm home? Some people are going to like one of those things more than the other. We, there's a hundred things 
that we need to unpack. We don't have time for it here, but you're, you're exactly right. Well, and it's going to affect multiple things, right? Think about HR. Uh, the genie's out of the bottle in terms of working from home. There are a lot of jobs that people didn't think could be done remotely that are getting done just fine, thank you. And by the way, the, a lot of those people are really good with not spending three hours a day in the car to make that happen. Um, now, it's not that they're saying, I don't want to go back to work, but I could work from home some of the time. Hey, that my wife, work. my wife, um, she she sa- is, loves working from home. And, and Lori says, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to go in about one day a week. And right? we're going to get a lot of that. But that's going to fundamentally change the way we operate. It's going to change the way we organize our work week. Hey, Wednesday is go to the office day, which means Wednesday I'm in meetings all day. And that's fine because that has to happen. And by the way, I like the people I work with and seeing other human beings is a beautiful thing. Um, But it's going to change the way we organize our work week and our lives and a lot of things. And the repercussions, we literally have not begun to calculate how much that's going to change things. And you know, there's, I'll put another wrinkle in there is that there are some organizations that have grown during the pandemic, Lori's situation being one example, where even if you wanted everybody at the same time, you couldn't. Or some people are going to say not everyone wants to be there because they, even after some of the COVID stuff is is you know calming, people aren't going to want to have that many people in space. So we're going to have some people, everyone's coming two days a week, same two days. And we're going to have some places where everyone's coming two days, not necessarily the same two whole other set of repercussions, right? And as leaders, he says, remembering what this is all about, (laughs) as leaders, we need to think about how are we going to organize our time? How are we going to facilitate those meetings and those conversations that need to happen? Really simple example. One of the things we hear about or heard about (laughs) before March was oh, these hybrid meetings are a nightmare. You've got five people in the conference room around the conference table, and you've got a couple of people dialing in, and you know there's all kinds of inequity and frustration, and uh, there's all kinds of things. Well, one of the things that's going to happen is as a result of everybody having learned how to use a webcam, and you know we have been bludgeoned into Zoom land uh, to the point where it's no longer a big deal, is there are going to be fewer of those meetings and more meetings that are completely online, even when some people are in the office at their desk, because it levels the playing field and makes it easy for everybody to contribute equally and, and do all of that. Um, that's a really simple, but it's going to be a massive change in the for way we people. function. Good news is it won't be for us because that's the way we've been doing it for a long time. So that's just not a hypothetical suggestion. That really does work. And there have been many times, although not in the last several months, when there were two or three people in this building with me, where I'm at right now, who didn't come in here or we didn't go to a conference table for everyone else like Wayne and others to join us. But rather, everyone sat in their in at their computers, doors closed, so we didn't have reverb and echo and stuff. And that's how we've done it. And, And I strongly would recommend that. So I want to I want to talk about a couple of things in the book. In the book we are talking with Wayne Tremell about the brand new book, The Long Distance Teammate: uh, Stay Engaged and Connected While Working Anywhere. Um, there's a couple of things in the that, that, well. I'm going to say talk about one thing that we get asked about all the time that we address in the book, and one thing mm-hmm. that we sort of brought we believe we're bringing to the fore uh, in, in the book. And the first of those is the one we get asked about all the time, and that's remote productivity. So. Uh, now, leaders as teammates and leaders thinking about their teammates, all the same. Like, what, what, give us a couple of pieces of advice, Wayne, about what we can do to be more productive when we're working alone by ourselves at home or wherever. Yeah. Well, the first thing is make sure you understand the term productivity because it's really, really easy to be kind of buried alive in your task list and work really, really hard and not be productive. I mean, at the end of the day, and I'm a big fan of simplifying 
consultancy terms, right? So productivity We're not figuring that out today, Wayne. Yeah. Not at all. We haven't figured productivity that out is doing the right work at the right time in the right way. That's what being productive is. Uh, the caveat there is what do we mean by right? Well, work that, first of all, our productivity is dependent on two things. It's our work, our tasks, our KPIs, the work that we're being measured on, right? We have to do the stuff we're being paid to do. Um, and as a member of a team and as a good teammate, there is team productivity that has to be met. And so you can be really, really good at knocking your metrics out of the park and getting your tasks done and going, yep, done. But if Bob is struggling, right? Or if Bob is can't do his work until he gets that report from me and I'm getting it to him at the last possible moment, thereby I've got my check mark, but I've slowed him down, right? I am not helping the team be productive. And so when we think about the right work, it's really balancing the work we have to get done that is the right work at the right time, whatever, and the team's work. And that's what being a good teammate is, is you find that balance. I think that's exactly right. I'll add one thing that I think that I'm hearing all of the time. Well, everyone's still getting their stuff done. So they're being productive. No. Right. Because I mean, on top of what you're saying, and that is that I, I always say that productivity has a numerator and a denominator. So just because people are getting working hard, working longer, brute force, getting it all done doesn't mean productive. That just means that means getting it done. But it should be getting it done in, in a timely manner, to your point, but in an amount of time that makes sense. Most people have just sucked up all that commute time and got it to and used it to work. But if they're not getting any more work done, they're not being more productive. They're being yeah, less it's, productive. And this is actually, as much as all the people who advocate for remote work and all of that um, are kind of doing the happy touchdown dance, because see, we told you this would work. There is a very real downside and dark side, which is most of us were never trained to manage our time or put guardrails around when are we working and when are we not and so you know some of us are answering email literally before we're out of bed in the morning because the you know electronic umbilical cord is ever present and we're still answering them after dinner and we're at the kids soccer game and we're head down over our phone and all of those things um at least when there was a structure as much as we hated it, there was a structure. Your day began and ended. And when you were in the car, work was over. <laughs> we're now having to learn how to work very differently. And so um, even though, as, as you say, the numerator and the denominator, and, and nobody told me there would be math today, but... I didn't give you any numbers. That's true. But, you know, that is the amount of work in the amount of time. Right. Yeah, it's exactly right. And by the way, leaders, um, you're impacting that. And uh, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been a, uh, I've been a, a culprit of this, and I think better than I used to be, uh, of sending emails whenever it worked for me, and sending the message to everyone else. Oh, I guess I should still be working, um, or I don't want to be the last one to respond to that email or that Slack message or instant message, whatever it is, Teams message, whatever. And so we've got to be really careful about that. I got one more thing, Wayne. I, I I knew that this would be engaging and this would would probably go longer than it probably needed to, but I've got one thing that we talk about in the book that. I, is new, I believe, that uh, I'd like you to talk about just a second. And the phrase is that we call it ethical visibility. This book is about how do I be an effective team member, and it's about how do I be productive and all those things. But there's a career component to the book because the longer we're working at a distance, the more we've got to think about, okay, how do I advance my career? So talk a little bit about ethical. Well, this goes all the way back to engagement right? Which is one of the fundamental problems with the way we usually think about engagement is we're giving, we're giving, we're giving, we're taking one for the team, we're being proactive, we're helping our teammates, we're doing all that stuff. But in order to stay engaged over the long time, we need to be getting stuff. 
we need to get recognized for our work. We need to have people building relationships with us and creating relationships that keep us engaged. We need to know, for example, that just because we're working remotely, we haven't been bumped off the career track or that the manager is going to give all the chances to the brown noses in the office. Or, right? man, Joe works in the office on the same day as the boss, and I'm not. I mean, there's my hybrid future. Right. right? And I'm so literally, day, right? this goes back to something we said earlier about how out of sight, out of mind is not malignant or badly intentioned. It's just a thing. And so if you're going to stay engaged over the long time, the long haul, if you want to be thought of as a great member of the team, if you want your work to be recognized, if you want to stay on the career track, you need to be visible to your teammates and your manager. And a lot of us have had that bred out of us. We've been taught that that is self-serving and weaselly and it's office politics and it's all of these things. But if we don't have a healthy dose of self-interest, right? Key if we aren't visible, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the thing is, it, it's a healthy balance. Uh, and, and there are some things that you can use to guide that, right? When you are making suggestions, is it we language? Is it for the team? Or is it me, 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 me? Right. Uh, are you kind of using brute force to get your way rather than engaging? You know, are, are you taking part in meetings because you like the sound of your own voice or because if I sit on five meetings and nobody hears from me, why would they think of me? Right. I mean, <laughs> right? You're, just, you're just one more face on the Brady Bunch gallery screen, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so the two words are really important. You need to be visible and it needs to be done in an ethical, positive way. Um, and, and that means it's okay to do certain things. You know, when you're having your coaching conversations with your manager, and, and leaders, if you're having the coaching conversations, we know that it's easy to forget the career development stuff because you're busy doing tasks. Part of ethical visibility is I own the right to say, hey, Kevin, you know, a couple of months ago, we talked about this. I'd still like to, to take part in that project or do that task or take right. that class or whatever. I own that. And if I don't raise it onto the radar, there's a good chance it's not going to happen. And it's not evil and it's not malignant and it's, it's not none of those things. It's right. nobody's fault. And if I'm going to stay engaged, if I don't see a future, right? If I'm not getting the reward and recognition that I need for my work, if I'm not having fun with the people that I work with, and building positive relations, I'll just go work somewhere else. That's where disengagement happens. And it, look at this, it all circled back. Ultimately, we own that. Without Absolutely. being ethically visible, it is almost impossible over the long time to stay engaged. Right, if we don't see the future for us, even if we don't want another job, right? Having a seeing a future for ourselves does not necessarily mean I want to have my boss's, boss's, boss's job. It might mean that. doesn't have to mean that, right? So I love how you brought that all back. So a couple things, Wayne, before we finish. Um, you know, all work and no play makes Wayne a dull boy. Uh, what does Wayne do for fun? Oh, man. Uh, Wayne does a, a bunch of stuff. I live in Las Vegas. Yeah, you live in what some people call Fun City, after all. Yeah, although for the last nine months, you know, I could be in Muncie. Indiana for all the difference it makes. Uh, I, I do a bunch of stuff for fun, but mostly I, I am not just, you know, doing the consultancy writer thing. I also write fiction and that is a whole lot of fun, both short stories and novels. My, uh, you know, I've done four novels now uh, that are out in the world. And, and the reason that's fun is not only is the writing fun, but most of my social life is with other writers. My writers group, different people that I've met in the community who do the same thing. And so the, because I have worked from home for 15 years or so, right, I need to make sure that I have fun outside of the house. And so that's where a lot of my social interaction and other things 
come as well. People, if people want to learn more about those books and that work, where can they go, Wayne? Uh, the easiest thing is if you go to Amazon and type in Wayne Termel, you'll see all kinds of things, including the long distance teammate and the long distance leader, but also my novels and stuff that I've written in the deep, dark past kind of all is oh. there for the world to see. And there is a WayneTermel.com, which is specifically about my fiction, non-businessy stuff. Uh, if you want to know what we're doing around this, then remoteleadershipinstitute.com is the place to go. So I have never met a highly effective leader that wasn't a reader. I've never met a highly a good writer who wasn't a reader. So the question I ask every single guest, Wayne, is what are you reading these days? Tell people one thing or a couple things you're reading. Doesn't matter yeah. what it is. Over the holidays, I made a very intentional <laughs> effort to just kind of chill. And so I read, there is a writer who tortures me. His name is Mark Helprin. And he wrote A Winter's Tale and Paris in the Present Tense. And, and I just finished reading A Soldier of the Great War. And the reason he tortures me is that his prose is so beautiful that it makes me just want to hang it up. <laughs> it's like, I could never do that. Uh, but it, it's just wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, lyrical stuff. And I wish I loved anything in the world as much as he loves New York City. When he describes New York City, it's just amazing. And I've been to New York. I mean, it takes some work to make me love New York, but he does it. We just got a comment, and I'm going to put it up here uh, before we wrap up. I think it's it's helpful, and uh, we've had we've had three or four comments. This one, and I happen to know Tracy, as it turns out. Hi, Tracy. Uh, having been a work from home team member, teammate for over a decade, I truly appreciate this conversation. I'm looking forward to a new world of work where the flexibility stigma diminishes and diversity is embraced as women strive to achieve work life effectiveness. So I think that's an excellent point. We've had some other great comments come in from folks about uh, the thoughts about. Uh, productivity and, clarif and uh, clarifying how we think about that as well, which I think is great. But Tracy, we, the, 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 what Tracy said, though, about the flexibility stigma is really true. Um, it relates to women, certainly, right? Traditionally, a kid gets sick, somebody needs to work from home, mom's the one that goes, right? And that bears on how people view her career track. Um, a lot of HR departments have kind of said, okay, you can work from home, that's a perk, but you have basically taken yourself off the career track. We have assumed that you are choosing lifestyle over your career. Um, as the stigma starts to go away, it's going to create opportunities, yep. not only for women, but for people in small towns, for people with disabilities, uh, all kinds of new opportunities are going to go there. And there's a whole conversation about the flexibility stigma that I am totally stealing that phrase. <laughs> Thank you, I Tracy. see it has been stolen. Um, there you have it for sure. Cause we've had that conversation, but we haven't had the phrase and thanks to Tracy, we now have it. And I, speaking of those of you who are in the audience, whether it's live or later, I have a question for you before we wrap up. And the question is now what? What are you going to do with this? Whether you have your leader hat on and you're thinking about how you can support your team members uh, or whether you're thinking about it as a member of the team and as a teammate, what are the ideas that you're going to take from this and take action on? Because until you take action, it's hard to think about this as being of much value. And while Wayne is pretty darn entertaining, hopefully you got more from this than just a little entertainment time. So uh, Wayne, uh, any last chance, any final, final thought before we wrap this up? Not really, uh, except to say that it, this all again comes down to engagement. And if you get nothing from this, it, it's, it's this, that engagement does come from within. And so if you are not getting what you need, maybe it's because you're not giving out what you need to give out. Uh, as a and so ask yourself are you just a member of a team or are you really a teammate 
It's the right question, and we'll, we'll leave it at that. This episode has been brought to you by our brand new book, The Long Distance Teammate. We are so glad that you've been with us. Uh, we're here every week, not e here live every week. It's not always for a podcast, but you know if you're if you're listening to this podcast or watching it from wherever you get your podcasts, you know we'll be back next week because we always are. And we'll be back again next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody, and thank you, Wayne. We'll see you next week.